So uh, happy International Women's Day again to everybody. It is so great to be able to mark this day together with some of my favorite activists, thinkers, um, artists, feminist leaders. Um, we're here because the Trudeau government have declared that Canada has a feminist foreign policy. Um, and as part of this, they've established a feminist international assistance policy. They convened the first ever women foreign ministers meeting. Um, they appointed an ambassador for women, peace and security. Women currently hold three of the four most important positions in Canadian foreign policy, Melanie Jolie, Anita Anand, uh, and arguably Chrystia Freeland as well. But at the same time, the Trudeau government has increased military spending, uh, patriarchal institution, the largest purveyor of violence. They've opposed negotiating a treaty to abolish the nuclear weapons, uh, which we'll hear more about. They've sold arms to misogynistic Saudi kingdom. And so we have to ask, would a genuine feminist foreign policy not seek to rein in weapon sales um, in the Canadian armed forces? Uh, the Trudeau government's feminist foreign policy uh, rhetoric also rests uneasily with other areas um, of Canadian policy abroad, such as mining. As we speak, um, the Prospectors Developers Association of Canada are holding a massive mining convention in Toronto, um, and the Liberals have sent four ministers to attend. Um, this is the same government that has disregarded their promise to rein in Canadian mining abuses abroad, um, and yet sexual assault uh, often plagues communities uh, near Canadian-run mines. Um, as primary caregivers, um, women are disproportionately burdened by the ecological destruction um, caused by the mining um, and with very few economic benefits to them. So today we're going to be taking a critical look at whether Canada's new so-called feminist foreign policy has in fact increased gender equality um, and lessened gendered violence and abuse around the world. Um, what is the potential of a genuine feminist foreign policy to help solve the world's most pressing problems, militarization, climate change, uh, inequality? Can a feminist foreign policy pose a challenge to an international system that's rooted in colonialism and conflict and racism? Let's, let's find out more from our speakers. So tonight, um, actually it's the afternoon, um, our first speaker is Ray Acheson. Delighted to um, introduce Ray, who is the director of Reaching Critical Will, which is the disarmament, disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, or WILP. They provide analysis and advocacy at the United Nations and other international forums on matters of disarmament and serve. And Ray also serves on the steering group of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for its work to ban nuclear weapons. Ray is the author of Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, and Abolishing State Violence, A World Beyond Bombs, Borders, and Cages. Welcome, Ray. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for including me in this great discussion. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you on International Women's Day talking about feminist foreign policy, which is a subject that I have uh, a lot of thoughts about um, and specifically related to the Canadian government's approach to feminist foreign policy, of course, too. And to answer your question in short, Bianca, about whether feminist foreign policy can mount a challenge to colonial and patriarchal structures. In theory, yes, but unfortunately, what we've seen today so far with the policies that have been developed and, and implemented um, and the, the suggestions of what a Canadian feminist foreign policy could be from the government, what we've seen so far is that these policies tend instead to co-opt feminist language in the pursuit of anti-feminist goals. And so when I say anti-feminist, I don't just mean policies against women, I mean a broader sense of intersectional feminism in which we try to understand and then stop and prevent the overlapping oppressions related to sex, gender, sexuality, race, class, disability, citizenship, geography, and, and many more experiences and identifiers. There's a distinct disconnect and even really an oppositional force at work in some of the feminist language that has been deployed in these in these policies that actually serve to preserve or to strengthen structures of state violence. Um, so it's about diversifying 
militarism or diversifying empire, diversifying extraction, um, and you know, acknowledge, acknowledging that women have been historically excluded from policy making, decision making, and then incorporating women as a monolithic group into structures without actually addressing the harms that have been created by these structures or you know, talking about their abolition, gasp. So that's what I'm here to do today. Um, and I'm going to focus on just a few things. Um, I'm going to focus on nuclear weapons, autonomous weapons, and policing, if I have time for it. Um, so really quickly to start, Canada is complicit in the creation and testing of nuclear weapons, historically, and all of the harms that nuclear weapons have caused and continue to cause around the world today, mostly on Indigenous lands and waters. And Canada is also complicit in perpetuating nuclear possession today through its allyship with the United States and support for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization nuclear doctrine. And so last year, the year before, in the General Assembly, um, Canada said that it actually understood and supported nuclear deterrence. And so this is an explicit acknowledgement of this policy. It's not just an, a tacit acceptance of it within NATO. But it wasn't always like this within the Canadian government. Um, Shulv Egeland, who's a Norwegian researcher, he did a deep dive a few years ago on opposition within NATO against uh, the nuclear alliance and against stationing of nuclear weapons and found that the Canadian history is actually quite complex. Uh, previous Canadian governments rejected NATO becoming a nuclear alliance, opposed U.S. stationing nuclear weapons in Canada, but these positions eroded over time because of intense pressure by the U.S. government, and a lot of that pressure was actually gendered, and some of what Shulf dug up was language from U.S. political officials um, patronizing and making fun of, in a very gendered and sexualized way, the Canadian politicians who were opposing the nuclearization of NATO and of Canada. So subsequent governments have folded over times, and now it seems like we are, you know, the Canadian government is generally in support of, of nuclear weapons, and that's where we are today. And so it's in with this within this context that Canada was not a leader within the humanitarian initiative on nuclear weapons, attended some of those meetings, but was oppositional to the development of a ban on nuclear weapons, um, voted against the establishment of negotiations of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, refused to participate in those negotiations. Prime Minister Trudeau called the treaty, quote unquote, sort of useless once it was adopted because the nuclear armed states were not involved. So there's a general obsequiousness to US power within Canada's position on nuclear weapons, which is particularly egregious considering that the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, is one of the first uh, feminist international legal agreements related to nuclear weapons. So the treaty recognizes the gendered impact of INA radiation, it calls for greater women's participation within nuclear disarmament policy making, and it was also negotiated arguably in a much more feminist fashion than a lot of international treaties are. There was no veto for the heavily militarized countries the way there is with a lot of agreements. Uh, it was a much more collaborative drafting process in many ways. It was open to participation from civil society and affected communities were active in the, in the negotiations as well. The first meeting of states parties of the treaty that took place last June appointed a gender focal point to implement the gender provisions of the treaty and produce guidelines for gender sensitive victim assistance. So there's this whole body of work that the TPNW um, is promoting, which is arguably in line for what a feminist foreign policy should be. And I do want to caveat that this is not in any way, you know, the uh, we're not in a perfect space with this treaty either. The language is quite binary, um, only recognizing men and women. Uh, so we need in future agreements related to this treaty to be inclusive of all genders um, and to also call for participation of LGBTQ plus and other marginalized people. Um, going beyond the binary also is important in recognizing differential impacts of nuclear weapons production, testing and use. 
And of course, we need more space within the treaty context and the work of governments in terms of universalization and other streams of work to look at gendered norms around nuclear weapons and around power to really address concepts like militarized masculinities and how these impact nuclear policy and how our feminist understandings and queer theory and analysis can help us really challenge some of the core principles, normative principles around nuclear deterrence and just geostrategic stability and all of these concepts which have really um, been used to promote nuclear weapons over the years. So the Canadian government should embrace the TPNW as an element of its feminist foreign policy and work for nuclear abolition. But instead, what it's been doing is pretending that the nuclear arms control agenda, an agenda which has not gone anywhere for the past two decades, is where it should be putting all of its energy. And so it makes it look like it's doing work when actually it's helping to delay and defer nuclear disarmament indefinitely. And I wanted to raise here really quickly too that Germany recently released a feminist foreign policy and it actually has some elements related to nuclear weapons. And it says that it supports efforts to recognize and compensate the victims of nuclear tests and that it will promote research into gender specific impacts of nuclear weapons and that it will champion humanitarian arms control. So this is quite novel. We haven't seen any of the other feminist foreign policies have these elements and Canada should also look at this language. Um, but I also want to note that it's not super progressive either because it's kind of putting the bandaid on the problem, right? It's saying, okay, we'll, we'll do a gender sensitive analysis of the victims of nuclear weapons. But Germany also stations US nuclear weapons on its territory. Germany is part of NATO's nuclear doctrine and hides under the so-called nuclear umbrella. So an actual feminist policy for Germany, just like for Canada, would be for nuclear abolition and support for the TPNW. Um, and this is this sort of, this co-option too of the language of humanitarian arms control is something I wanna highlight because that's not actually a thing. Um, since the landmines treaty in the 90s, we've built up a body of knowledge and work and a community of actors, diplomats, civil society activists, the Red Cross, working in humanitarian disarmament. Humanitarian arms control is not a thing that exists. So again, it's another example of how these allegedly feminist governments are co-opting language in order to make it look like they're doing really progressive work when actually they're undermining the more progressive work that could be happening. This is also an issue for the Canadian government when it comes to autonomous weapon systems. And just for folks that aren't maybe super familiar with this issue, for the past 10 years, there's been a UN process to try and prevent the development of autonomous weapons, which essentially are weapons that would operate without meaningful human control. So they'd be able to target and attack people without a human operator actively being involved in decision making. So this would be done with algorithms, artificial intelligence software, and we can see already how biases have been coded within AI systems that have led to racial and gender discrimination. So facial and voice recognition systems, predictive policing programs, there's a rape of problems with all of these systems already. And so we can imagine how devastating this is going to be if it's embedded within weapon systems. The Prime Minister gave the mandate for Canada to support a ban on these weapons a few years back, and that's something the majority of countries in the world support, along with the Red Cross and activist groups and tech workers and scientists and many others. But instead, Canada has gone along again with the United States to propose some voluntary commitments and also to promote the alleged benefits of autonomous weapons. So they actually say this technology will be good for humanity, result in less collateral damage, it won't be emotional, um, and it, it will be more precise. All the same things that we've heard about drones, right? And we've seen what's happened with armed drones in the world. But one of the specific alleged benefits uh, that's asserted by certain governments, including the US, is that, quote unquote, robots won't rape. So they see autonomous weapons as specifically being a solution to eliminate sexual violence and conflict. So of course, this is very problematic. It overlooks the fact that a weapon, depending on what form that weapon uh, takes, can actually be programmed to do anything. But putting that aside, more importantly, it overlooks that conflict itself leads to increased sexual and gender-based violence. 
Autonomous weapons are going to lower the threshold for the use of force in the same way that drones have, which will lead to the death of civilians. It will lead to displacement and destabilization within societies and communities. And all of this creates the conflict for more sexual violence. So there's a lot of problems with autonomous weapons. I just wanted to highlight this one because of the topic of this webinar. Um, but I think that the Canadian government's position on this, once again, points to a major problem with its feminist foreign policy, which is that it's not acknowledging that militarism is inherently antithetical to feminism. And that is the broad point that I think we all need to, to be emphasizing. And as long as Canadian foreign policy is so closely tied to US foreign policy, it cannot be feminist. And it's this kind of discrepancy between rhetoric and reality and this tendency towards co-option or half measures in relation to feminism that is really consistent throughout this Canadian government's approach to feminism and to militarism across the board. So very quickly, you know, it claims this government claims to want a feminist and an equitable relationship of healing and acknowledgement with First Nations, and yet it sends in the militarized RCMP to repress land and water protectors who are on their, on their own land trying to protect all of us from the dangers of fossil fuel extraction and environmental damage. And we can see this with the Wet'suwet'en right now. So this is why we need to have solidarity amongst our movements for demilitarization, decolonization, and feminist peace. And as activists, I think we really need to recognize the limits between the government's approach to nuclear weapons and other aspects of militarization. And I know Tamara is going to talk about many of those, so I won't go into them, but the arms trading and manufacturing and the fighter jets and NATO and everything else that, that we're doing in the world right now, we need to link that to the government's approach also to First Nations, to policing and the carceral system, to migration, to houselessness and poverty, and all of these issues, because they're all connected. They all rely on violence to sustain a system of inequality. And we need to recognize that these are institution of violence that cannot have a feminist approach. And that any attempts to make these structures feminist is co-opting our movement for peace and justice and equality. So we really need to push back on efforts to, and I don't really like this phrase, but it can be useful to pinkwash and also to rainbow wash because it's a similar struggle in the queer movement as well. We have to push back on these efforts to make structures of violence more inclusive and work instead for their abolition. So just to end with three specific recommendations for a Canadian feminist foreign policy, renouncing nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence policy, ratifying the TPNW and working to compel the nuclear armed states to disarm. That's one set of recommendations. Working actively to ban autonomous weapon systems in coordination with other states, the Stop Killer Robots campaign and the Red Cross. And then more broadly, decreasing military spending and militarism at large and acknowledging that militarism is inherently anti-feminist and anti-indigenous and decrease funding to police, stopping fossil fuel and other resource extraction, both in Canada and abroad, and supporting land, water, and forest defenders in Canada and abroad as that segment of recommendations as well. So there's a lot of other things, like I said, that I could say about the feminist foreign policy, but I'm gonna leave it there for today. And I really look forward to hearing from Claudia and Tamara and Al. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. That was incredibly informative. Um, thank you for that caution uh, to not allow uh, feminists and our feminist agenda to be co-opted in, uh, in the goal of anti-feminist goals. Um, and thanks also for the clear-sighted call to understand militarism as antithetical to feminism. Um, we do need this call for solidarity um, that you put out both at home and abroad, and um, thank you for doing the important work of connecting the dots between these different struggles. So please, um, folks at home, do support the, um, the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, there's several actions that you can take. We'll post those in the chat. Support uh, the Stop Killer Robots campaign as well. Uh, thank you, Ray, for being such a force. I look forward to hearing more more from you in the Q&A. Also, please do check out their books, uh, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, as well as Abolishing State Violence, A World Beyond Bombs, Borders, and Cages. Our next speaker of the afternoon is Tamara Lorenz, 
um, who I think is well known to many of you. Tamara is a PhD candidate in global governance at the Belsilly School for International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. She's a member of the Canadian Pugwash Group, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, um, CFPI, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She's also on the International Board of Global Network Against Nuclear Power and Weapons in Space. Welcome, Tamara. Tamara, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, happy International Women's Day. It's really nice to be with you all. Uh, the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women conference is underway in New York City, and it's a two-week conference that runs from March 6th to March 7th. The Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW, one of the organizations that I'm with, has a delegation there. And they have brought these really lovely purple pins to pass out. And a big banner with our message, Women Unite for Peace and Disarmament. Unite for Peace and Disarmament is our message because this is not what Canada is doing. So on Canada's feminist foreign policy, there is no statement or document that articulates what is Canada's feminist policy. There is nothing in writing. So we have to carefully listen to what our government says and look at what our government does in the world. In November 2021, Liberal Member of Parliament Melanie Jolie was appointed as Canada's uh, Minister of Global Affairs. Her mandate letter from the Prime Minister stated that she was to, quote, continue to develop and implement Canada's feminist foreign policy, advance Canada's national action plan on women, peace and security, and build on Canada's leadership to further this agenda on the global stage. Last May, Minister Jolie hosted a visit by Sweden's foreign Minister Anne Lind in Ottawa. Sweden, of course, was the first country to launch a feminist foreign policy in 2014, and that's what inspired Canada. Now, at this public event with Lind, Jolie explained that Canada's feminist foreign policy is, quote, not a label or branding, but it is the full implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. This resolution requires all member states to ensure that women have equitable participation in decision making on matters of peace and security, and that states engage in conflict prevention, peace building and peace support operations. Jolie later elaborated that, quote, Canada's feminist foreign policy is centered on building a more gender equal world, one that is free from violence. However, an honest assessment of Canada's international actions would show that what we are doing is the exact opposite of the women, peace and security agenda. We are engaged in the patriarchal violence of militarism, war and economic exploitation around the world. Last month, the Trudeau government announced another multi-billion dollar weapons package to Ukraine. Over the past year, Canada has sent approximately $1.5 billion worth of ammunition, sniper rifles, machine guns, howitzer artillery guns, rocket launchers, hand grenades, an advanced missile system, and tanks to the war-torn country. Thousands of Ukrainian and Russian soldiers and civilians have been killed, and millions of people have been displaced. Yet in an interview, Minister Jolie explained that it's not time to talk about peace, it's time to arm them. Not once before Russia's invasion or after has Canada's top diplomat used diplomacy and met with her Russian counterpart to end the conflict. Not once has Minister Jolie called for a ceasefire and negotiations to end the war in UK Ukraine. Yet diplomacy and conflict prevention are crucial pillars of the women, peace and security agenda and of a feminist foreign policy. What Canada is doing arming Ukraine cannot be described as feminist. Canada, along with other NATO allies, want to keep the weapons flowing and the war going to bring Ukraine into the Euro-Atlantic alliance, to weaken Russia and to enrich Western corporations. Corporate interests drive so much of Canadian foreign policy. Ukraine is the largest country in Europe after Russia. Ukraine has the most agricultural land and some of the largest deposits of iron ore, graphite, and lithium. This week in Toronto, as 
Bianca mentioned in her introductory remarks, in the world's largest mineral exploration and mining convention is taking place called PDAC. On Monday, our deputy uh, Prime Minister Christia Freeland was at PDAC and she met with industry leaders and talked about Canada's need for critical minerals for electric vehicles, she said. But what she didn't say was that we also need critical minerals for weapons. All of the weapons that the military uses and that are being sent to Ukraine require critical minerals. And this is what Canada is after. For six years, Canada and other NATO countries have been hosting a Ukrainian economic reform conference to have greater access and control of Ukraine's resources. And this is what is really behind Canada's so-called feminist foreign policy, extractive capitalism, NATO militarism, and maintaining Western domination. It's not about democracy and human rights. That's the rhetorical mass that covers the reality, as Ray also alluded to. Remember, in February 2004, Canada, the United States, and France overthrew the democratically elected government of Jean Bertrand Aristide, the beloved president of Haiti. This coup 19 years ago was directly, has directly led to the political crisis and gang violence today. Last month, the Canadian government sent spy planes and warships gunboat diplomacy to Haiti, but the people are desperately poor. They need their own government and they need humanitarian aid. And that's not what Canada is sending. Um, in fact, what Canada is helping to plot is a new military intervention in Haiti. And by comparison, Canada has sent $5 billion in humanitarian and military aid to Ukraine in one year alone to prolong a war. Um, I want to urge you, if you haven't already, to watch this really important film entitled Haiti Betrayed. It's available for free on the Canadian Foreign Policy website, and it reveals the truth of what Canada has been doing in Haiti. Ten years ago, after Canada helped overthrow Haiti's government, we worked with the United States and Ukrainian ultranationalists to overthrow the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Kyiv in 2014. The Canada-US-backed violent Maidan protests have directly led to the war raging in Ukraine today. I want to urge you to read an article by Dr. Ivan Kachinovsky. He is a Ukrainian-Canadian political scientist at the University of Ottawa. And Dr. Kachinovsky wrote this important article in Canadian Dimension entitled The Hidden Origin of the Escalating Ukraine-Russia Conflict. And I will put a link uh, to his article in the chat. Five years ago, after the successful coup in Ukraine, Canada and the US led another regime change operation, this time against the democratically elected government of Nicolas Maduro in 2019. Uh, we set up the Lima Group of right-wing Latin American countries to try to force Maduro out. Canada and the West have not succeeded so far in overthrowing the Venezuelan government, but our sanctions are harming uh, the people. And in the case of Venezuela, it is very clear that Canadian mining interests are at play. Canada's illegal sanctions that are not authorized by the UN Security Council are enacted against a dozen countries, not only Venezuela, but China, Russia, Nicaragua, Zimbabwe, Iran, and Syria. It's because of Western sanctions that the Syrian government can't get uh, the aid that it needs to deal with the devastating earthquake. And sanctions are another form of economic violence or hybrid warfare, their collective punishment against the people. Canada's increasing military spending and arms exports also defy a feminist foreign policy. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, its latest report entitled Trends in Military Spending, Canada is ranked 13th highest in the world. Canada spends approximately $35 billion annually on the Department of National Defense, which and this has increased by 70% over the past decade. And it will go even further because of NATO's 2% GDP target that we that we aren't uh, we haven't met yet. And what we're doing with all of this money is we're buying a new fleet of F-35 warplanes, warships, attack helicopters, and armed drones. 
Canada is also one of the top arms trading countries. According to CIPRI, Canada is ranked 17th highest in the world for weapons transfers. In 2021, our arms exports increased by almost 30% to approximately $2.7 billion. Canada exports weapons to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the UAE, and Israel, countries with troubling human rights records and repression. You often hear that Canada is a leader in peacekeeping. According to the UN Peacekeeping Office, Canada is currently ranked 70th in the world for peacekeeping. Canada only has 59 soldiers wearing the UN blue helmet out of an armed force of 95,000 soldiers and reserves. Despite the Trudeau government's 2017 LC initiative, a pledge to increase women in peacekeeping, Canada contributes only 20 female soldiers to UN peace support operations. By contrast, Canada has thousands and thousands of soldiers on NATO operations. In Latvia alone, Canada has seven, 700 soldiers leading a NATO battle group. With NATO, Canada has caused so much death and destruction in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. Now what NATO is doing in Ukraine and against Russia and against China is so destabilizing and dangerously risks a nuclear escalation. Our foreign policy that is so dictated by the United States and NATO is making women's and girls' lives around the world more insecure. And there has never been any accountability in parliament or by the public. So this is why our Canadian women's organizations, VOW and WILP, are calling for Canada to get out of NATO and for the alliance to be abolished. We believe that a feminist foreign policy is impossible within a US-led nuclear-armed military alliance of 30 wealthy Western countries. Three years ago, the Trudeau government promised Canadian women that we would have a feminist foreign policy. In 2020, consultations were held by the Women, Peace and Security Network, our organizations are a member of that network, and we contributed to those consultations. There were two documents that were produced, What We Heard and Be Brave, Be Bold, and they were sent to the Department of Global Affairs. These reports compiled recommendations um, that we had for a feminist foreign policy, um, guided by the values of nonviolence and cooperation and solidarity, respect for human rights, uh, rights and democracy and uh, the sovereignty of other countries and prioritize diplomacy, disarmament and demilitarization. We also called for Canada to withdraw from NATO. The federal government said that it would launch this uh, new feminist foreign policy statement based on our feedback in the spring of 2021. Well, it's been two years and we're still waiting. There is no sign of it. So it is up to us at the grassroots level to be the feminist foreign policy that we want. WILP Canada has a campaign, demilitarize, decarbonize, de uh, 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 de decolonize, and this is what we want for peace, gender justice, and climate justice. VOW also has a campaign, feminists against militarism, women say no to NATO. We encourage you to join us and get involved. And finally, we need a radical reimagination of our role in the world. We need an ethic of care to guide what we do, and we need to repair the harm that we have done to other countries. We also need the courage to transcend this new Cold War that we find ourselves in and make friends with our enemies. And this is what I tried to do last November. I traveled to Egypt, Russia, Finland, Latvia, and Poland, and Romania for four weeks, and I talked to women from all walks of life using people-to-people -people diplomacy, strategic empathy, and peace building. Um, imagine replacing NATO military bases that are dotting, dotting Russia's border along um, Russia's border in Eastern Europe and all of these battle groups and imagine that we replace them with art and cultural and language centers. We need to work together in sisterhood with women and allies of all genders across borders. So let's unite for peace and disarmament. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Uh, thank you for that rousing presentation and the incredibly broad overview from mining to NATO to arms exports and the need to oppose uh, Canada's 
role in undermining countries in the global south seeking to redress inequity. Thank you for being such a champion for peace and your courage in taking tough stances uh, against war, even when it's not popular to do so. I posted uh, Tamara's uh, incredibly comprehensive article um, from Ricochet about NATO's misdeeds in places like Libya, Afghanistan, uh, Yugoslavia and beyond, um, and its embeddedness to in, uh, in, in Canada, um, and the call for Canada to, uh, to join uh, a coalition against uh, NATO, among other articles. So thanks again, Tamara. I look forward to hearing more from you in the chat. For those uh, at home who are asking, yes, we will be rebroadcasting this to um, YouTube. It's also going to be on Facebook. Please do share um, uh, with, uh, with your colleagues. Um, so next up, we have uh, Claudia de la Cruz. Uh, Claudia is the co-executive director of the People's Forum and serves on the Code Pink Board of Directors. Claudia was born in South Bronx to immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. She's a popular educator, community organizer, and theologian. Welcome, Claudia. And thank you so much, Bianca, and, and thank you to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for organizing this event and inviting me. Um, it's an honor to, to be on this panel with such amazing activists and obviously commemorating International Working Women's Day. I'm very happy to reclaim the radical legacy of collective resistance of this day with you all. Um, so coming into the space as an educator, as an organizer from the imperialist core, of the United States, I think it's important to note that there is no feminist policy or any life giving policy possible when at the very root of any nation and its policies is the war economy of capitalism. An economy that creates conditions of misery, of poverty and suffering and thrives from death, from theft and extraction um, is not one that is conducive to building anything that's feminist. The democracy, the peace, the security of the capitalist will never mean justice for the working class, particularly women of the working class and girls of the working class. I live in a country where there are more than $17 billion that are spent in the separation of immigrant families, deportations and border patrol where there are over 160 million people who are living, or ne living in or near poverty. The US holds the highest incarceration rate in the world, spends up to $7.5 billion a year in prisons. Where the Biden administration, there was so much of a debate between you know, Trump and Biden, but it's the same, same BS. Um, but the Biden administration is strengthening the carceral state with an increase of $37 billion. We live in a country where 13.8 million households face unaffordable water bills, where the collective total personal debt in the US is at an all time high of $14.96 trillion. In the United States last year, more than half of all personal bankruptcies were due to the inability of people paying their medical bills. And so I ask what present, what future is there for working class women under these conditions? It was once said, I believe it was Mandela who said it, that the true character of society is revealed in how it treats its children. In January, 2020, there was over 580,000 people who were experiencing homelessness in the United States, of which 20% were children. There are approximately 50 million children living in poverty in the US. 20% of children go hungry in the wealthiest country in the world. I'm from New York City, the home of Wall Street, the home of the biggest and richest, uh, most powerful banks in the world. Nearly one in 10 students in New York City public schools were homeless last year. One in 10, a rate that has stayed largely the same for the past six years. A total of 104,383 children lack permanent housing. They lived in homeless shelters, in cars, in parks, in abandoned buildings. So what present, what future is there for children under these conditions? Um, last year, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, which is, has historically served as an instrument of the ruling classes, playing that role with more fervor now, 
um, in favor of the most conservative and far right elements of the ruling class. The most recent attacks on abortion, the banning of and criminalization of abortion needs to be understood as part of a larger agenda, um, which is ultimately to establish a new form of governance in this country. The regression on civil rights guaranteeing any legal rights to the poorest and historically marginalized. In the same month that the Supreme Court ruled against abortion rights, they ruled to curtail the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to regulate the energy sector, limiting it to measures like emission controls at an individual power plant and establishing that the government doesn't have the right to regulate corporations. So hunger, homelessness, unemployment, the rolling back of basic human rights that have been fought and won by masses of working class people, the strangling of any and all attempts of popular democracy, the displacement of entire communities in the interest of corporations, white supremacist militarized police trained to kill black and brown youth. That is war. That is class war. It is war that is waged against poor and working class people in the United States and around the world by global capitalists. This is the imperialist war that the US leads and exports to the rest of the world. Why is this important when we're talking about feminism? Because some people might say, you know, we're talking about feminism, why talk about all these conditions? Because there is a liberal feminist discourse that speaks about the diversity and representation as a center of our struggle. A liberal feminism that tells us that it is enough to have women and particularly women of color in government positions, that their sole presence in those spaces is a collective win. Um, this liberal feminism comes in all colors, in all shapes, in all ethnicities, but its diversity is superficial because it represents one interest, the interest of the ruling class, constantly voting against the working class and supporting war in all its forms. The living conditions of working class women in the United States and around the world continues to worsen and will continue to be worse if we continue to accept these liberal politics. We can't afford liberal and lukewarm politics anymore. We need to go beyond liberal language that co-ops progressive language to mask the brutality of the capitalist agenda. Our lives aren't compartmentalized and our basic human needs are impacted by all policies, all of them, domestic and foreign, housing, employment, healthcare, food security, the economy, and peace with the justice, because there's no such thing as peace without a last name and needs to have justice included in it. These are all parts of the feminist agenda. They, they, they must be at the center of a feminist policy. In a society that centers war and profit, with a budget of $900 billion, towards military spending, committed to death and exploitation for the sake of profit, and where there's misery and the men at the, at the center of all, these of all these policies, that's a capitalist and imperialist agenda that by no means is feminist. And we, we need to be able to say that. It's capitalist, it's imperialist, and it's not feminist. The most impacted by the global imperialist war will always be those who have been historically exploited, oppressed, and marginalized. I'm very glad and very thankful that Tamara mentioned Haiti, that mentioned Venezuela. We owe a great debt to Haiti, the first Black revolution in this continent. And it was a working class revolution with women at the forefront. And so, you know, we need to accept that those at the, in the global South who have fought, have fought colonialism, who now fight US imperialism, are at the biggest disadvantage and suffer the most when we talk about war. It is Black and Indigenous communities. It is the poor, the working class women's bodies that continue to be the battlefield, the, that, that, that where rape continues to be the tactic of war. Families are destroyed. They're displaced. Hopes and possibilities of building full lives are stolen from millions of women and their children and their families. NATO, AFRICOM, the Southern Command, and over 100 military bases that the US has all around the world to maintain its military dominance. Those have to go. The IMF, the World Bank, are instruments of economic control that maintain the global South in shackles, the shackles of death. These are instruments of war that continue to endanger all living beings and the planet. We must demand the dismantling of NATO 
the dismantling of Africa, the dismantling of the Southern Command, the shutting down of Guantanamo as part of our feminist agenda, because that, that human life is at the core of our agenda. The protection of Earth and the planet is at the core of our agenda. We must demand the ends of the sanctions and blockades. Tamara also spoke about Venezuela being sanctioned. Sanctions and blockades are instruments of war affecting the lives of millions of women and families. And the US is stubborn and fixated in bending the Cuban and Venezuelan people into submission. But these socialist projects, as Fanon said, and I like to bring Fanon into the question, they, these folks are stubborn in their, their refusal to return to a subservient condition to the US imperialist form of operating. And Cuba and Venezuela are beacons of hope for working class people around the world. And the advances that they've made regarding women and family rights, despite decades of blockade and sanctions, these unilateral coercive measures must be a reference for those of us who are fighting against patriarchy and capitalism. They must be a reference. These are points of study for us. Rather than buying into the narratives of the US capitalists, we must study what the advances have been in Venezuela and Cuba, because these are exactly the things that the United States wants to blockade us from learning. Today, today, right now, as we speak, there are more than 900 illegal sanctions imposed on Venezuela by the United States. These unilateral coercive measures have a significant impact on the revolutionary government's ability to advance its social programs and raise the living standards of its citizens. Despite the US hybrid war against Venezuela, the Valavarian revolution has been able to advance the living conditions of the majority of its citizens, the poor and working class. It has raised the standard of living and participation in the political development of the country for working class women. In 1998, for example, there was an article, Article 88, that was adopted into the constitution of the Valavarian revolution, which recognizes domestic labor as a generator of economic value. It's in the constitution. We cannot go into the US constitution and find anything that has to do with the most basic rights of its citizens. And that is the contrary when you're talking about the Valavarian revolution. The constitution of the Valavarian revolution establishes that gender violence is punishable by law. Article 75 declares that family relationships are based on equal rights and responsibilities, solidarity, mutual understanding and respect. In 2017, there was a historic ruling by the Supreme Court that allowed gender and name changes and an advancement against patriarchal values. At its very core, the Varlavarian revolution understand that there is a historic debt owed to the working class. And in particular, there is a historic debt that is owed to the working class women. And its revolution is built on the basis of humanistic and revolutionary ethics, which is expressed in its commitment to the political, social, and economic development of working class women and their families and their communities. An expression of this are the comunas, the communes, the ways in which the neighborhoods are self-organized and how they are supported by the revolutionary government and have local leadership. And these are the heart of the revolution. Another expression is a large number of cooperatives, collectives, and popular organizations that center the rights of women and who are revolutionary and actively participating in deepening the revolutionary process in Venezuela. Cuba has lived 60 years of an economic blockade by the United States, a blockade that cost, has cost Cuba daily $15 million a day. Imagine that, $15 million daily, an estimate of $154 billion in the last six decades. Despite this, Cuba exports healing and life to the world with brigades of doctors. It developed five, five different COVID vaccines that serve the Cuban people, and it has also served the rest of the continent when the United States and Canada were hoarding vaccines. Cuba just recently embarked in a process of approving the new family code. Um, the process uh, opened for discussion in over 78,000 spaces across the island, 78,000 spaces. So it was being discussed at all levels. More than 400,000 proposals were accepted to create more than 24 versions of the code. And this code reaffirms the right of, 
to same-sex marriage, the rights to survivors of gender violence, the rights to reproductive health, the rights of children, the rights of direct family, meaning grandparents and uncles and, and aunties, the rights to survivors of gender violence, um, you name it, much more. And I hope folks could actually look into the new family code in Cuba. Um, since its inception, the Cuban revolution recognized the rights of women as human rights, and it established the Federation of Cuban Women who worked really closely in the development of the new family code now, but overall has accompanied the Cuban revolution and women in Cuba in its development of laws that continue to ratify women's rights at all levels of society. And I share this with you also, you know, making like a little asterisk and saying, by no means are these processes perfect. However, they center human life. And that's the huge difference between these socialist projects and the capitalist projects that have been proven by history to be a failure to humanity. I share these with you, um, and, and some of you might already know this and feel the hope in this, that as you know, we are told that capitalism, you know, the, the only thing that we could do with capitalism is reform it. Like we are, we're taught to imagine the, the end of the world before we can possibly imagine the end of capitalism. And that's the biggest lie, the biggest lie that many of us have actually bought into. Capitalism has not advanced the lives of women or any marginalized group. What has done that is collective struggle. Collective struggle is the only thing that has been able to advance our possibilities of living within capitalism. It is possible to build a society that operates on the basis of collaboration, on the basis of solidarity, on the basis of justice. It is possible to build a society that centers the life of people and the planet. That society we need is impossible to have and sustain under capitalism. But socialist projects that are, that are working to advance life show us that it is possible. It is possible that society um, under, under capitalist aggression, under imperialist aggression, is impossible for human life to be able to be sustained. We cannot fight patriarchy without fighting the systems that sustain and reproduce them. Capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy. The only way to fight these is through political organization, is through organized struggle, is through the deepening of our class consciousness. If we do not become politically organized to fight capitalism and imperialism in all its fronts and all the spaces, we're allowing barbarism to win because that's where we are today. It's either socialism and the projects that advance life of, or barbarism, which is the worst stage that we could find in capitalism. And just to conclude, the reason for this geostrategic war uh, that the US is moving towards against Russia and China which uh, Tamara was going into very, very eloquently, for which Ukraine is a battleground is extremely significant. This is a very significant issue to look at. This moment is very, very important for our human history. It signifies the battle to reorganize and realign the world with an imperialist force, which is the United States that is in decline because the US empire is in decline, but it's fighting to the, to the end, to be able to reorganize and realign the world to its favor. And so feminists who identify ourselves with working with the working class and the oppressed of the world, we have a responsibility to contribute. We have a position to take, and it must be an anti-capitalist and an anti-imperialist position. And history teaches us that we have fought and bled for all and any advances we have made. Nothing has been granted to us, nothing. It also teaches us that the capitalist powers remain in control of determining the future of our lives. We have no choice but to change that. And in order to do so, we need to destroy the war economy. We need to fight towards the revolutionary goals of ending capitalism and imperialism. We need to radically imagine what a socialist society can look like. There are references in history, and I will mention it again. There's Cuba and Venezuela as our most recent and closest examples of what is possible in a society. We must reclaim that radical revolutionary historical memory 
in order to imagine a new world and create that new world that we so desperately need. And I want to thank you again for the time, Bianca, and for the organizers of the event. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Claudia, for that brilliant presentation. Um, we really did uh, need that important U.S. perspective, the reminder of the, the domestic conditions, you know, while we're spending billions on war, destruction, misery, um, for widening uh, our understanding of the instruments of war and for this need that has um, you know, been mentioned by our other panelists to go beyond the liberal language that co-ops our struggles. And thank you for taking us back to the history too uh, of this important day and, and the reminder th uh, that of the working class struggle at the heart of a transformational feminist agenda, pointing us to examples of victories and vision policies that, as you so poignantly say, center human life. Um, so thank you for helping lift the limits that have been placed on our imagination. Very inspiring words, very, very clear. Um, I can't wait to hear more from you in the Q&A. So our final presentation uh, of the afternoon is from poet, uh, professor, and activist Elle Jones. I am totally thrilled to introduce Elle, who is a spoken word poet, educator, journalist, a community activist living in African Nova Scotia. Elle is the first, uh, the fifth poet laureate of Halifax. She's a co-founder of the Black Power Hour, a live radio show with incarcerated people on CKDU. Elle was named the Nancy's Chair of Women's Studies at Mount St. Vincent University uh, for the 2017 to 2019 term. She's the author of Live from the African Resistance and Abolitionist Intimacies. Welcome, Elle. Thank you. Sorry, my screen was all weird and I couldn't hit the thing. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm basically going to do these poems in response to what Claudia was talking about. So here we go. A woman's going to send the drones. So ready the covers of your vogues, the food bank lines are now miles long, but a woman's the one who sends the bombs. Liberal feminism can't be wrong when a woman's the one who sends the bombs. Can't get workers PPE, but you go girl, Nancy Pelosi, all hail the bipartisan war parties. Now Trump is gone, we all agree. George W. Bush has been redeemed. The war criminals are on our team and there's a black woman on my TV screen. And when she bombs, I'll yell, slay queen. We'll force your countries to be free and little black girls can finally see themselves in drones and F-16s. And this is MLK's dream brought to you by Wall Street, brought to you by the elites. We'll never ever give you peace, fund military and police, but a woman could be commander in chief. See what can happen when you believe. This is gender equality, so everybody take a knee, the resistance heroes, hip, hip, hooray, the FBI and CIA, the generals and NSA, so please enjoy your new air base. We all forgot Abu Ghraib, we all forgot Guantanamo Bay, and none of them will see the Hague, the Patriot Act, so yesterday. We're all in love with John McCain, make Lockheed Martin great again, centrist neoliberals all the rage, kids still living in a cage, the war party is here to stay, and let's lock Julian Assange away. We can't let him expose the truth. We're never bringing home the troops. Obama's so cool shooting hoops. You'll all be crushed under the boot. We're plotting out another coup. Billionaires we won't prosecute. We save that for moms of truant youth. Those Timberlands were looking cute. So let the oil companies pollute hell. Put them in the cabinet. Add bankers to make up the set. We'll regulate the internet. Corporate news is all you'll get. But a woman's going to send the jets. Are you many women happy yet? This moment gives me all the feels. A woman's making weapons deals. A woman's making refugees. A woman's going to rob and steal. Last week, we were environmentalists, but now wars for oil are feminists. And history will reminisce how all the donors benefit. Orange man is out the door. Things can go back to how they were before. Biden voted for the Iraq war. How dare you ask for any more? Your kid's still super predators and his kid's on strike number four, but prison's just for you and yours. And really the crime bill's all your fault. 
This is the time for unity. Bow down to oil and energy and let's be friends with GOP and white suburban families. There's no more white supremacy. Black woman deliver us the vote. We'll still be kneeling on your throat, but a woman's going to send the drone. So volunteer to work those phones so we can bomb some woman's home and probably waterboard her son. They're back in fashion, neocon. So four more years of settlements. War parties are in agreement and let's hashtag black excellence. Kamala is is vice president. The ladies join the gentlemen in sword famine, wild beast pestilence, the four horse persons of apocalypse. These days we call that feminist. Is this the dream of suffragettes? And I heard her bombs never miss. And don't forget to call her Ms. Madame, her honor, she or ma'am. Get ready those detainment camps. Muster the troops, line up the ranks. A woman's going to send the tanks. And all of us will give her thanks, especially weapons manufacturers, banks. And thanks to those suburban moms, a woman's going to send the bombs. I'm glad a woman is so strong to send our countries all those bombs. <laughs> all right, I'll do one oh, more. Uh, actually, two more, because I got to do one on Canada, but we're just picking up on Claudia. So this was a poem for the end the blockade event on Cuba. Canada, of course, does not have the blockade, but we continue to be the junior partner to America's general fuckery. So here we go. No more blockades. We need medical brigades. It's inhumane to block the needles. Vaccines for the people. See how power does its evil. See how power is illegal. War is their cathedral and their actions are so lethal. No CIA to come invade. It's time to end this US-led charade. We stand with Cuba unafraid. We shout out, end the criminal blockade. They put Cuba on the list, but we all know the real terrorists. The ones who oppress the poor and make economic war for 60 years or more violating international law, the hypocrisy is extreme. We'll sell arms to oil regimes, we'll fund the corporate machine, and we'll never intervene as Palestinians scream. Our morality so select, responsibility to protect. Protect the colonial project, the wealth of the 1%, and the people can't collect on any of this check. Nah, they want their boots stuck on your neck while your children die in debt. So you can be a black site prison, a servant for tourism. You can work in sweatshop conditions. They can dump their ammunition and they won't brook any opposition when the people have a vision, when the people have a mission, when the people are physicians, when the people are musicians, when the people are technicians. So they'll strangle their nutrition for the crime of giving back the land, for the crime of kicking out the banks, for the crime of taking money from the hands of corrupt politicians and their gangs. And we all know who gets paid Paid, which is why they're so dismayed as our people live in tents under bridges and highways. You see, they're scared of an outbreak, not of COVID, but of rage from the cashiers and the janitors and the drivers and the maids. So they have to keep Cuba contained. And that's why they stopped the trade, because the people disobeyed, because their spirit wouldn't fade. Revolution's a grenade in the minds of the enslaved. Just ask Mandela why he raised his fist and shouted, Viva Cuba Libre. And that's why they fought follow this crusade, but the people won't be played and justice may be delayed, but the chickens always roost and the beds are always laid and the truth won't be betrayed. We stand with Cuba unafraid and that's why the world is shouting end the US blockade. Hypocrites, hypocrites can't stand Cuban literate. They want resources stripped, their greed is infinite, but you see how we resist and not just resist, but keep on dreaming. Doctors sent to tend our health across the Caribbean. 2,000 Cuban lives laid down for South African freedom. Neoliberalism don't want you to know there's another way of being while our own people are freezing, hitting up against the ceiling. They're so busy starving Cuban babies of the calories they're needing while they sit on all the profits the pharma companies are thieving, but they still can't stop the teaching. Equality is what we're feeding. We can do without new Jordans. If if everyone is eating, they just don't want black people breathing. Colonialism keeps us bleeding. And that's why Che Guevara is still gathering believers. And that's why Fidel's revolution never will be sleeping. And that's why they won't succeed to ever crush the lives they're squeezing. No more working in the heat while they're resting in the shade. No more fighting over scraps while they run the whole buffet. And no more scrambling like a dog to lick the boots of USA. We should address the genocide of indigenous people our own 
own country made, instead of preying on an island with people living day to day, all for some right wing exiles in Miami because they have a lighter shade. Your moral authority has long ago been drained and there's another revolution somewhere already taking shape. And that's why we're tearing down your statues and the symbols of your hate. And that's why Amazon workers unionizing left them so irate. And that's why we stand with Cuba and our reckoning won't wait because the debt the world owes Cuba will never be repaid. And that's why the world is shouting, end the blockade. No more pointless suffering over this masquerade. Justice for the Cuban people, end the criminal blockade. Thank you. And I'll do one more very quickly just to move us to Canada. I'm super sweaty. Okay, uh, this one's a kind of old poem, uh, but here we go, it's still true. Welcome to Canada, where you probably heard of lumberjacks in flannel shirts and voyageurs in beaver furs. And don't you know that we say A after every word? And we've got that handsome young prime minister. They probably didn't tell you about the lack of drinking water on reserves. And there's over 2,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. They say this is unceded Mi'kmaq territory, but fracking still occurs. Take a walk downtown and see the history we preserve. Now a majority of people here in Halifax approved and said statues celebrating Mi'kmaq genocide shouldn't be removed. But then they say there's no racism here. So perhaps you are confused. You'd be forgiven if you didn't hear about all the black kids suspended from our schools. Did they tell you about the colored home and all the children they abused or the solitary confinement that we like to use on youth and all the black and indigenous communities our government pollutes? And wait until I tell you about immigration detention and the people we refuse. We shackle women to their beds and we say that's just the rules. Oh, but I saw Trudeau hugging all those Syrians on the news. Did anybody take you to that Tim Hortons drive through while well, they hire foreign workers and then threaten to deport them? But when you buy that double double, that's probably not important. The UN released a report saying racism here is deplorable and we're building luxury condos instead of housing that's affordable. We had to settle with Omar Khadar because we allowed him to be tortured. We won't let Chelsea Manning come across our borders while we welcome war criminals who perpetuated slaughters. But people think Canadians are just so polite and so adorable. We love to feel superior and to wave the maple leaf. We're very proud here of our shipyards and all the jobs that they've increased. We just don't mention who those warships will be killing in the Middle East, just like we don't talk about the slave ships that funded Alexander Keith. Don't worry, for a rich person in Halifax, he really was not unique. If you committed genocide in Africa, we'll honor you with a street. If you're on the side of slave owners, we probably named a university. We were the number one suppliers of salt cod to plantations in Haiti. Our merchants petition parliament against the end of slavery and that south end money came from trading with the confederacy we exploit the migrant workers picking our apples and blueberries this really is not a friendly province for workers or employees the cops are on the sunshine list but we can't get a rent freeze but the poverty in this province never makes the highlight real Lighthouses and bagpipes are probably the only thing you see. We leave Africans crossing the border out in the snow to freeze. And please don't read the comments on indigenous stories on CBC. We've got white supremacist groups interrupting ceremony. They shot fireworks at the water defenders protesting Alton Gas. A mass shooter drove around in a police car in a uniform and badge. We tried to pass a motion to ban the Confederate flag, but our police are more concerned about these mythical black gangs. Did they tell you? African Nova Scotians were 400 years upon this land. They promised farms and land grants and then they stole it back. White people changed the names of their communities beside us on the map. Sidewalks and grocery stores are just a couple things we lack. And now they're investing millions on prison construction contracts. If you come around here near Canada Day, you can attend the military tattoo. Just don't expect to learn about Canada leading Haiti's coup or maneuvering with Afrikan or in the Lima group or the rape and torture of teens in Somalia by our peacekeeping troops. They'll never tell you about our mining companies, militias and their sexual abuse. You'll never hear it in our media. There's a whiteout in the news. The submarines come in our harbor weaponized with nukes. On the ground in Africa, we're putting down our boots. Our politicians team with corporations to go around the world and loot. And the military roam our schools collecting new recruits. Moving on, 
You might want to be careful as a woman taking cabs. Unfortunately, consent laws are optional for our judges to understand. And I know women walking downtown where white men snatched off their hijabs, but we're in the land of tolerance as every Canadian brags. If you're tired of hearing about residential schools and Cornwallis taking scalps, take a walk in the public gardens where you can relax. Oh, I forgot about the Boer War monuments to concentration camps and the murder of Nigerians commemorated on a plaque. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Did you hear we were some promised land for Blacks? Did you drive by our arena named for Scotiabank? Say that name in the Caribbean and you probably won't get thanked. And our money in the region has us joining imperial ranks. The police down in New Glasgow even got themselves a tank. But say colonialism in Canada and people draw a blank. Because let me tell you about our national sport. We're all fans of hypocrisy. I'm sorry, did I get that wrong? I meant to say hockey. Far be it from me to criticize Sidney Crosby, but white people here in Canada, they don't care about black bodies. People are still denying that this country once had slaves and police on their patrols are sending black men to their graves. Indigenous and black bodies are filling up our jails. They stop us six times more in Halifax, but they say that that's not race. It couldn't be. That only happens down in the United States. And if you leave this city over the McKay Bridge, you might want to look out of your window and wave goodbye to Africville. And you might hear the cannon firing at noon off of Citadel Hill. It's just your daily reminder of all the Mi'kmaq that we killed and the control they have today while police impose their will. And the elders in our communities are ill from the landfills and that colonizer slave trader king still bracing all our bills. And then you turn on US TV and they say, Canada, I heard that place is chill. If I could only move to Canada, my dreams would be fulfilled. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Goodness. The great Elle Jones. Just so good. Terrific. Thank you, Elle, for giving voice to our outrage, uh, to the inequity, to the racism, imperialism, and hypocrisy. Yeah, welcome to Canada. Very powerful, powerful stuff. You're a force, and we're very lucky to have you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there's a link to Elle's newest book, Abolitionist Intimacies, in the chat, uh, which is available from Fernwood Publishing. Hope that you can uh, stay with us a little bit longer for the Q&A. So everybody, uh, that concludes our presentations. And uh, we're now moving into the Q&A portion of the evening. If you have questions, put them in the, in the Q&A box. I um, also want to thank uh, those that left uh, some questions in advance as well, and we'll get to as many as we can of these time permitting. We don't have that much time left, but um, we'll take a couple of questions. So the first is uh, kind of housekeeping. Heather wants to know where, um, where, where, where Heather can get a copy of this powerful poem. Is there any way to access uh, these poems, Elle? Um I think the last one's actually in my, I don't even know it's in my book. I, I think the last one's in my book. I think it's there. Um, I don't think the other two are online, but if you send me an email, I can send it to you. I'll send put my email in the chat. Okay, wonderful. So Elle's put uh, her email in the chat. Uh, get a copy of both of her, her books, Live from the African Resistance, and more recently, Abolitionist Intimacies. Um, both must reads. We have another uh, technical question from um, someone who's asking uh, whether there's a report of the trip that Tamara made to Egypt and uh, and the other in the several European countries. Tamara, is there a report of your of your journey? Uh, I, it's not written yet, but I have done about three webinars on it. It's called if you do a search on YouTube, it's called. Um, in the search for peace, climate uh, and conflict, and Tamara's trip to Egypt, Russia, Finland, Latvia, Romania, and Poland. And I did meet with uh, Ukrainian refugees. I wasn't able to go to Ukraine. I have contacts in Kyiv, in the Donbass, and in Crimea. Um, but I did talk to Ukrainian refugees outside of the country while I was while, while I was there. And I want to uh, just take this opportunity to encourage people to defy the travel advisories, the bans that that ca the Canadian government has about, you know, not going to Russia or China or Iran and, you know, North Korea. 
all these countries and to go and to meet people because what you'll experience on the ground is very different from what the government tells us. And and we need, like I said in my remarks, we really need to make friends. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. Um, Julia, Eva would like to know whether our panelists have any podcast recommendations on some of the issues that have been touched upon. Does, does anyone have any quick recommendations for for stuff people can listen to. I guess I'll, I should I'll, go ahead. Go I was ahead. Gonna plug the breach a bit. We haven't done a new season, but um, our last season we had all kinds. So there was definitely some stuff on foreign policy and different stuff. So if you go on the breach, we had a YouTube show for a while, the breach show. Um, I guess I'll plug that. <laughs> All right, so everyone um, find out about the breach. I think it's, is it breachmedia.ca? I think so, yeah. Breachmedia.ca, yeah. Um, definitely follow the breach. Um, uh, L, L is on there. The CFPI has a lot of uh, webinars that you can watch on YouTube on a lot of these issues as well. Um, I, this is a great question. I, I too would like some podcast recommendations. And in fact, I think there just need to be more podcasts um on these important issues ray um yes one that a podcast i really like is movement memos um it's a truth out podcast hosted by kelly hayes and there it covers a range of of issues from the left and is really consistently incredible thank you great recommendation um all right so we have a question oh claudia I placed it on the chat, but there's a socialist program with Brian Becker that usually has a lot of information, especially around domestic issues and issues re regarding the war. And then there's another Code Pink podcast that is uh, WTF, I'm not going to say the whole thing, is going on in Latin America and the Caribbean, and that's by Code Pink. And so they do a lot of uh, the politics in the continent um, and U.S. foreign policy. So those two. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have someone who's going to be attending the uh, Canadian Labor Congress convention in Montreal this May, and they want to know, they want some strategies for how they can get the CLC to adopt a position against the war machine. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on, on that? Tamara. Uh, that would be incredible. We really need uh, labor to get involved in the peace movement in Canada. So I really encourage people who are involved in different labor unions across the country to, to get resolutions passed calling for Canada to, you know, cancel the F-35 program, to cut military spending, to withdraw from NATO, um, to stop sending arms to Saudi Arabia and to Israel, et cetera. There is a, um, a a small group, it's small but mighty, called the Labor Against the Arms Trade. Lot you can find out more information if you do a search, you know, on Twitter. And I also encourage you to reach out to the Canada Wide Peace and Justice Network. It's an umbrella organization of about 45 peace and justice uh, groups, and many of our of our uh, activists. Uh, have labor experience and they could, you know, support the, the work that you're doing and we can support what you're doing uh, from the outside. Uh, we also need people to engage with political parties because we have the same problem as they do in the United States. When Claudia said that there is this, uh, it, there's a superficiality, uh, you, uh, you know, these claims about diversity of opinions, you know, when you have more women, you know, we do, it, it's, it's superficial, we don't see that. And this is our problem in Canada. We've got a number of political parties in the House of Commons, and all of them support the war. We don't have any of the political parties, the NDP, the Greens, the Bloc, the Conservatives, the Liberals, they're all supporting Canada and NATO, this prolonging this war in Ukraine, high military spending. So we need people to get politically active with their 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 parties to uh, uh, to to help change course. Thank you, Tamara. So again, that's the uh, the Canada wide uh, network for peace and justice, um, the labor against the arms trade, um, and also I would add to that labor against apartheid, um, which focuses on. Uh, uh, Israeli apartheid and, and, and Canada's role in that. And um, there's also Common Frontiers, which does include uh, several labor uh, representatives. 
Um, so we have a question from uh, Yuri who wants to know about, he wants to understand um, feminine nationalists that support economic terrorism, NATO, pivot to Asia, war against Afghanistan, Russia, Iran, and elsewhere, even if feminism hasn't advanced as we'd like it. Um, it's simply unjust, says Yuri, and not good feminism to support any kind of militarism. And if we want defunding and abolishing of the police, we need to do the same with Canadian military and spy services. I'm going to add a question mark to all of that. A lot of a lot of uh, ground covered by Yuri. Uh, is is there any aspect of that that uh, any of our panelists would like to address in Yuri's question? All right. Well, maybe we can come back to maybe we can come back to that a little bit later. Um, I'm going to ask one of the questions that was submitted in advance. What is the relevance of International Women's Day historically to questions of peace and foreign policy? I know Claudia had touched a little bit upon the socialist history, the working class history of uh, of International Women's Day. Well, I, I could talk a little bit about it. I mean, I think it's important to understand the roots like this was done in the context of the of the internationals you have clara setkins who was a socialist who was looking at the conditions of women not only in europe but also in the united states specifically in new york and this comes after several like factories were burned with women who were working in the garment industry who were burned alive by the owners of those factories and so you think about you know exploitation and the way that exploitation works from the slave plantations to the you know textile industry and the factories the working class people working class women have um carried the weight um in a lot of ways in those in those fields in those factories and at home and so that has been an international process of exploitation that has developed what capitalism is and and what we know it as today and so in order for us to understand why working class, um, why the working class is part of the International Women's Day, which for me, like it's so pivotal to say International Working, uh, working Women's Day, because not all women are sisters. There is a huge group of women that belong to the ruling class, to so the capitalist class that are also liberals um, that will sell their mothers to be able to get money, to get positions, to get power. And so I, I think it's important for us to make the distinction that International Workings Women's Day has an international character. It has a working class character and it stands against the exploitation of workers internationally, internationally, especially the exploitation of women. And so I think going back again to the history and to the roots of how things are developed is highly important. Um, and it wasn't just any woman. Clara Setskin was a socialist. And that's also important to reclaim. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on the relevance of uh, International Women's Working Day, International Working Women's Day, uh, historically, when it comes to questions of peace and foreign policy? All right, I'm gonna move on to um, the next question. Uh, I kind of feel like this has been answered, but maybe we can explore it a little bit further. Um, does labeling our foreign policy uh, as feminist encourage better policies and encourage a national conversation about what a foreign policy could look like? Or does it just make it easier for the liberals to carry on with their harmful policies around the world? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Maybe, um, Ray, we haven't heard from you. Yeah, I was just gonna um, jump in here. Um, you know, I think it it's one of those things where any anything presents an opportunity for conversation, right? So I think having this on the table as an idea of, of what even is a foreign policy and how can it ever be feminist um, really challenges us to start engaging with some of the ideas that Claudia was talking about in terms of alternative systems that actually do promote life, promote care, promote solidarity amongst people, 
um, and diversity and equality, but in a way that isn't just about, you know, bolstering structures of harm. And so in that sense, I think having the premise of a feminist foreign policy on the table for discussion opens up this scope for us to talk about it. The problem that we've had with feminist foreign policies is that they're being developed by elites in power of capitalist states. For the most part, that's where we've seen most of the feminist foreign policies coming from so far. Um, and so within that context, it's exactly what we've been talking about today through all of our interventions is that what this leads to is a reification of the capitalist state and a, a glorification of imperialist war within those structures and, uh, and a sort of absorption of diverse bodies into these structures of harm um, and not actually working to abolish them. So that's where the problem really lies with the feminist foreign policy concept is who's developing it and why they're developing it and what their motivations for it are. And I did want to go back in this context to, to Yuri's questions, because sorry, I needed a second to reflect on them. But I think, you know, one of the things that's coming out there is that war isn't feminist. And so this, this using excuses of, say, women's oppression um, as an excuse to go launch a war is antithetical. And so um, I remember when the US launched its war in Afghanistan and saying it was going to go liberate the women. And I remember Cynthia Enloe's speaking and writing at the time was all about, oh, let's celebrate the glorious feminist Marines, right? Like, what an absurd concept that the US military is going to deploy um, to rescue women and liberate women, and that this is actually a feminist project that we all need to support and get behind if we care about women's rights and equality. And so that's how these concepts are easily manipulated and that we have to be um, pushing back on all of the time. And then the other question that he was asking or, or that they were asking in terms of um, abolishing military and police and the links there, in my mind, those things are absolutely connected and we need to be defunding um, all of these structures of violence. Both are absolutely in support of the capitalist system, um, imperialist militarism, as well as the carceral system uh, in the United States and in Canada. And one of the things that I wanna draw people's attention to, I know we're almost at a time, but I hope folks are aware of the construction of Cop City that's trying to happen right now in Atlanta. And this is a, a space where folks working for environmental protection and, and on climate justice, as well as racial justice against gentrification, police militarization, police brutality, and white supremacy within policing, all of these movements are coming together to try and stop Cop City. Um, the police have murdered one forest defender already. They've charged, um, I don't know how many now, 30 or more people with domestic terrorism charges. This is a site that they're building where police will be trained to repress dissent. And so they're being trained with military equipment to fight with military tactics in urban warfare. And police from all over the world will be brought to Cop City to train it's it's and they're bulldozing uh, hundreds of acres of a forest to build this facility. So this is, I think, a key example of how all of these um, structures of violence are intimately connected on their end. And that's why our movements to abolish them all need to be in solidarity with with each other in this moment. Thank you, Ray. Um, any other final thoughts from our panelists before we end uh, end for the evening on any of those questions or or anything for our audience to think about um, before we depart today? So I know that uh, Tamara has put a bunch of actions in the chat that people can take. Um, help, let's help push for uh, Canada to sign the TPNW, oppose the F-35s. Um, amongst many other things that you can do, find out about the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network and, um, and, and lots of other groups that are organizing. Um, as Claudia reminded us, organize, organize, organize. Um, that is the way forward. Um, it's been such a good afternoon. Thank you so much to our speakers, Elle, Ray, Tamara, Claudia. This panel for me has been the celebration uh, of International Working Women's Day. Um, 
I am hearing from the chat, people are feeling motivated and uplifted by your collective brilliance um, and your insight. Let's continue calling for a better foreign policy um, that increases the dignity, uh, rights and equality for an anti-war government. And as always, uh, stay informed, stay engaged uh, and peace everybody. Good afternoon, thank you. Bye, thanks. Thank you.